Uh, it's, it's real, I'm really thankful to be able to speak this morning. Um, it was a, felt like a long week preparing it, but we're here now, and we're ready to speak, and we're ready to share, and I'm excited for what God has to say. But first, before I share the word, I just wanted uh, to touch quickly on what happened to Easter camp, because I know that you guys were all very faithfully praying and, and, um, and donating your time and your your money to, to help make that happen, and um, it, was, it was a really cool time. Um, it was a really awesome time. We had 26 campers across the two camps, and 21 at the Year 7 to 10 camp where I was at, where Chloe was at, and a few others here. And we had five at the older camp with, um, with Juanita, wherever she is, uh, and Jack. And uh, it, was, it was pretty awesome. It was a whole lot of fun. Heaps of games played. Heaps of new friendships made, and spontaneous moments of fun were had, but I guess more than that, you can't go past what God did on camp. Um, the Holy Spirit, God's empowering presence was so felt across camp. It was um, just across the whole thing, and in the worship tent on Saturday and Sunday night at the younger camp specifically, like the presence of God was just thick. It was, um, it was impossible to go past, and it was, it was such a cool moment, and so many of our young people from our youth group got to experience that um, and make commitments to Christ and rededications to Christ and those sort of things. And um, we could go by the numbers, but I'd, I'd rather go by the names and, and I'm sure they'll appreciate it if they um, are publicly declaring their faith. But some of our young people, Bella, James, Isabella, Deacon, Dylan, Hannah and uh, Tommy all made first time commitments to Christ, which was flipping awesome. And... Others like Christian and Samuel and Jackson, Rosemary, Ethan, Sophie, they all rededicated their lives to God. And, and nine young people attending our youth are considering baptism. Sixteen want to know more about Jesus. So these are some of the quotes written by young people. Um, this is what they said on their, on their responses. After I got prayed for, it felt better and like the world's weight got lifted off my shoulders. Another one, I'll have to talk to, about, talk to my parents about being baptised. Another one, I've given my life to God. Another one, I definitely want to stay more focused on God in all areas of my life now and have grown deeply in faith. And another one, I have let people into my life. I have found people who care and accept me for myself. It's an incredible miracle. It's a testament to God's goodness and the power of prayer, your prayers, and these young people had this awesome moment, but they need continued support now. Um, so please keep praying and volunteering and contributing in the many ways you already are. And pray too for those young people who are yet to encounter God. Um, God is faithful. And our prayer is that these youth can see God is faithful as well. Um, well beyond the moments they had on camp. That others may learn about God through them that their families could come to know him through the faith of their, their children. Let's just keep praying and keep uh, giving fearless youth to God and, and just sitting back and watching our faithful God do miracles in that space. Um, but for now, let's continue our series today on the characteristics of God. Um, Dad started it last week and I'm continuing it on um, while he's away in Broken Hill having a good time. Um, don't know if he wanted me to say that, but that's fine. Um, no, he's on holidays. He's, he's allowed to. Um, let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to learn about you, to dive deeper into relationship with you, to encounter you in a number of ways here at church. God, I pray that we leave here knowing more um, and perhaps just growing a bit closer to you, perhaps learning that you are near. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm using the clicker today. This has gone bad in the past, but it'll be fine. One thing I want to get clear before I dive into what we're talking about today, because I don't want it to be complicated. There's a bit of theology, but there's not much. Um, so this is basically it. Um, what God does is who God is. Um, God's actions reflect his character, is his character. Like, for example, God loves us, so God is love. God is gracious towards us, so God is grace. 
Um, I guess it's important to know that God cannot ever act in any way that contradicts who He is. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, cool. So, my prevailing thought post-camp, after this awesome experience and after just a really powerful time, um, the thought that kept coming back to me and, um, and in talking to others about it as well is, is this idea that God is near. Um, God has come close. He is near. We saw this at camp and with this exciting, tangible presence, um, felt during worship, during small group time, even in games and meals, there was this unexplainable sense that God is near. But I'm not just talking about the tangible presence moments. We see it when prodigals return to God. Those who have turned their back and and walked away from God, suddenly discovering God again in a single moment of repentance. When we walk away, He remains near. Um, It says in Psalm 139, 7 to 12, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, and the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. It's a powerful verse and it's one that I think dad shared on like some of the later verses about being it's the same psalm about that talks about being formed in um, God knowing us when we were formed in our mother's womb and um, it's just really great but this psalm it conveys the idea that God is all present and all knowing Um, but when we say God is near I'm not just saying he's always literally nearby or close in proximity. He's not just um, unescapable in that sense. Um, God is also near in His nature and His actions. God wants to be near us, to have a meaningful relationship with us. He wants to know us. We see this in the Holy Spirit as an active, empowering, at times deeply personal presence in our lives. God with us. Sometimes... I think we emphasize the the dominance and overarching power of God. God is this big, major, transcendent being who is so big and powerful and he defeated death for all and he's massive and we just have to bow down and, and worship him and fall at his feet. And that's true, but God in this paradoxical way, he does things, is deeply concerned for the life of you, uh, life of you, the life of me, the life of you, and every single person here, he's not just fighting the huge battles against sin and death, however big they may be, but he has unlimited time for each and every one of us. I mean, how does that even work? It's a, it's a funny paradox, and it speaks to this idea that God is working in so many different ways. Um, theologians call this the imminence of God, that God doesn't just sit back and observe a creation which he set in motion thousands of years ago. He is present and actively participating in his world, in our worlds. I thought it'd be good to see this in Scripture. So here's a bird's eye view of the Bible. Uh, I'm just going to run through it, give you some ideas of where we see this idea of God being near. We see God's desire to be with his creation at the beginning when he walked with Adam and Eve. But after sin's entry to the world, when we rebelled, our relationship with God changed. Our sin and rebellion made us unable to continue living in the garden and humanity's unique, perfect relationship with our Creator was broken. So, our relationship with God was broken, but God did not desert His creation altogether. He remained near, not forcing Himself upon His people like an evil king, but allowing us, silly little humans, to have the keys to our own destiny remaining painfully present as we fumbled around in the dirt, hurting ourselves, hurting God, worshipping idols, and just generally doing what humans do. You can read the, basically the entirety of the Old Testament as just multiple examples of humans stuffing up. Um, it's a bit sad sometimes, to be honest. But sometimes, just sometimes, we'd recognise God as king of our hearts, 
like David or Jeremiah, God would make himself known to those people and their faith, their relationships with God would become pillars of hope for the next generations to follow. We speak of David, um, and I'll expand on him slightly. You, you hear his story where he was anointed from a young age to become king, but then Saul chased after him, wanted to kill him, and he was exiled and lamenting, God, where are you? I don't know, but I'll hold fast. And then he becomes king, and it all comes to pass, and um, it's an incredible time. And But he also sins against Bathsheba, against God, and, and this, like, massive sin that he commits is looks like it's going to shape his destiny but God still keeps his covenant with David and and Jesus is descendant from his line um, God remains near to David and David remains faithful to God and this is an example that is followed throughout Jeremiah as well he was I'll, I'll actually read a, a, a verse from Jeremiah 1 but he was a young really young person and and God called him and and this is what it says when Jeremiah speaks of it now the word of the Lord came to me saying before I formed you in the womb I knew you and before you were born I consecrated you I appointed you as a prophet to the nations then I said ah Lord God truly I do not know how to speak for I am only a boy but the Lord said to me do not say I am only a boy for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah was faithful and God remained near. Now we fast forward to the Gospels and we see Jesus walking and talking and eating with his disciples. And this is a glimpse of the relationship God wants to have with his people. And excitingly, the effects of his death mean that this can take place today. Jesus' death toppled the wall. It tore the veil apart, top to bottom into a veil that was the the thickness of my hand. Uh, Jesus' sacrifice meant our sin could no longer separate us from God. But not just that, when Jesus returned to be with his Father, as we know, he sent a helper, a friend in the Holy Spirit to live within us. Look, the story of God is one of love. The Bible, amongst its many purposes, details God's mission and desire for reconciliation, to be with his creation again, to walk with us again. Um, He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He remained near to his people through the Old Testament, even in their exile and rebellion. Jesus walked with his disciples close by them for his entire ministry. And when he had to return to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to stay near. Now, this is great. And I'm glad the Bible speaks these truths over our lives, but I'm well aware that outside of camp experiences, often God does not feel near. So here are some truths for us today that hopefully you can take um, away as, as hope to hold on to as we leave church today. So number one, God, that's, yeah, just the bit I said before, sweet. Um, <laughs> because God is near, God can never not be near. I know it's a double negative, but it was the Easiest way for that to make sense. Uh, God can never not be near. He can't, he's not waiting for us before he comes near. He's not busy watching over South America today and Asia tomorrow. He doesn't walk off when we upset him. He will always be near. One thing we get wrong is how we understand uh, the Holy Spirit, I reckon. When we say, come Holy Spirit, we're not asking him to travel from a different place to meet us. Thanks, Larissa. Can you hear it in my voice? Yeah. <laughs> That's just me quivering at the power. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, what, where was I? We, we get our terminology about the Holy Spirit wrong. Not wrong, but we misunderstand it. 
We're not asking the Holy Spirit to travel from a different place to meet us when we say, come Holy Spirit. The Spirit is already in us and around us. When we say, come Holy Spirit, instead we're saying, Spirit, I'm here, I'm listening, show me your glory. The reason you're not hearing from God is never due to a lack of His nearness. Could be a number of other reasons, but it's absolutely not because He's off somewhere else or not passionately engaged in your life. Often we're distracted, unwilling or unable to give the time to build a genuine relationship with the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps our lack of hearing from God is part of a deeper spiritual battle, a spiritual oppression or a spiritual dryness and season of doubt. Uh, Mother Teresa and many others talk of this, labelling it the dark night of the soul. And I don't have too much time to dive deeper into this idea But regardless of the situation you are faced with, God is still near. If you're downtrodden, downcast or damaged by the actions of others, God is near. If you're weak, depressed, unable to get out of bed in the morning, God is near. If you're cynical, doubting or disbelieving of God altogether, God is still near. And if you haven't felt God's presence in 30 years... I can assure you from the truth of the Bible I'm reading from, God is near. Now, these three words hardly solve the problem if you're going through it. The most infuriating thing is when you're suffering and God feels nowhere and someone taps you on the shoulder and says, don't worry, God is with you. Or don't worry, trust God's plan. It's infuriating. Are they wrong? Not really. I mean, it depends what perhaps you mean by God's plan, but there's got to be more going on. And you can't get past this question. How can a good God, present and actively participating in our lives, living in us, seemingly sit still while we cry out in pain and loneliness and anguish? I can't answer that for you. Some might try, and I, I kind of think it's a mystery that we won't know till we be with God one day. But one thing I will say is if you are in this place of forsakenness, of isolation, be comforted that you share your suffering with the crucified Jesus, nailed to a cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's, I was talking to Dad about this last night and he, spoke, he, he made the point that it's interesting that the centurion, after Jesus yells that out and, and passes away, the centurion's like, this must have been the Son of God. He saw God. He saw God was near. He saw that God had not forsaken him. But then you have the thief on the cross who mocks Jesus for not coming down and saving himself. Or maybe that was the Romans. But um, there's this paradox where some people are feeling God, knowing God's near. But when you're in it, when you're in the thick of it, God feels nowhere. You feel forsaken. But be comforted that you share your suffering with the crucified Jesus. Be comforted that it's okay to be in this space of forsakenness. Be comforted that God is still near. Be comforted that God's intention is to bring you out of this place of darkness. And be comforted that although you may be afflicted with pain and and with grief, you will not come to any permanent harm. Jesus' death and resurrection secures our eternal future with him. In Lamentations 3, 55 to 57, it says, I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry of relief. You came near when I called you, and you said, do not fear. If we can just grasp this truth of God's nearness and live by faith, even when you can't see or feel God, when you feel like every trace of him seems to have vanished, when you cry out to God at the end of yourself and ask why he has forsaken you. If you can still live by faith and obey, even in this place of pain, scarcely anything can overcome that type of faith. This is that Romans 12 renewing of the mind that we are talking about. And Habakkuk 2.4 says, The righteous shall live by faith. If you can hold on in those moments, I don't think anything can take you down. 
if God remains near, God remains with you, what can overcome you? What can come against you? Faith is a funny thing. When we talk about the righteous living by faith, it's, I, just, I find it interesting because it's another one of these funny paradoxes in the Bible. Would we be living by faith if God made himself really obviously known to us every time we ask that of him? Surely it would be impossible not to believe. But then we would follow out of obligation and not of our own free will, not out of faith. And that's the kicker. To experience God is a beautiful thing. There is little sweeter than sitting in his presence, experiencing God. But to believe only out of experience is a weak faith. And this is not to undermine the pain of feeling forsaken or the immense impact of these glimpses of God we call experiences. But we are called to live by faith and not by sight. It's what it says in 2 Corinthians. Um, another analogy I heard is um, one of pilots who fly planes. That's what pilots do. Pilots are specifically told not to look out of their windows, not to look out the window of their cockpit when flying a plane. They have to trust the instruments and readings in front of them. Sometimes we just have to trust the instruments to live by faith and not by sight. What are our instruments? Maybe the Bible, maybe the truths in the Bible, prayer, community that we have around us. Yeah, living by faith is not easy, but it's what we're called to do. One camper at camp had an experience like this, and I thought it was really cool. His name was Matt. He couldn't have been older than 15. But on Saturday night, he came forward to respond to an altar call along the lines of, and if you feel like you can't see or feel or hear God, or you haven't for a while, come forward and receive prayer. So he, Matt walks up, and though he could see and sense that everyone around him was hearing from and experiencing God, he wasn't getting anything. You can just imagine in that moment, you're, you're, maybe your arms are forward, you're, you're praying, and you see the corner of your eye, people just crying and weeping around you, and you're just not feeling anything. I think a lot of us have been in that place. But in that place, this kid, Matt, came to a realization that he did not have to experience God to know that he is real, to know that God is good, regardless of if he felt his presence or not. The cool thing is, after that realization, God made his presence felt in Matt's life. I think he got prophesied over twice. And we can talk about that, we can dissect and we can say that, oh, God put that thought in his mind. He did, he was near, he... he helped Matt come to that realization that God is good. But regardless of the situation, for Matt, God didn't feel near, but he came to that, that renewing of the mind, faith realization that God is near and he is good. So like any father, I think, at, at the right time, God wants us to step out in faith, to find our feet, a brave faith, a courageous faith, perhaps like a kid losing the training wheels and trusting his dad's promises that he'll be okay, the bike will hold him up. If the best thing for us was to know that without a doubt God is real, I am 100% confident God would emphatically reveal himself on national television or TikTok or whatever, then it would be wild. If, if the best thing for us was God was real, we'd, we'd know it, all right? Like, uh, maybe he'd have a, a, a show at 8 p.m. on a Thursday night that we'd all tune into. God would do anything for those that he loves. But God loves us enough not to force himself on us. Instead, he gives us the choice to trust in him or not, to have faith in what is unseen. But he is near regardless. Learning to trust God's goodness even when you can't feel it, that's the stuff that has the enemy quaking in his boots. So that's my point. God can never not be near. And the one other truth I have, and this is just a quick one, and I, I might get the band back up if that's all right, is um, God is near because he wants to be near. God will always be near because he wants to be near. We can never change that. Even in our opposition and our sin, something we can't change. And I'm pretty stoked about that. Because God's nearness is not just a descriptor. It's his character. Nearness is not just a part of his being. He's not just begrudgingly near because he has to be. He actually loves us dearly, each and every one of us. 
and he wants to be near passionately participating in our lives. Look, there is nothing you can do here on earth that will separate you from God. You can spit on him, you can curse him, you can mock him, you can ignore him, you can make him the punchline of every joke, you can abuse his followers, you can burn his Bibles, you can persecute his believers. There is nothing you can do. Why? Because he loves you too much. He remains near, not intruding or imposing, but ever present, ready to enter into a relationship with those who love him back. What more can we ask from an all powerful God? This is a chance to respond to these truths, perhaps to respond to God. And I've got a couple of people. I feel like God has brought to mind. Um, but let's, let's take a chance this morning to respond. If, you, if this has affected you in any way, if God is pressing on your heart or there's just something going on. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. For those who have been encouraged by God's nearness today, who are actually just enthused by this message and perhaps just, yeah, strongly encouraged I ask you, how can we reflect God's character to those around us? How can we reflect God's nearness to those around us? How can we remain near? How can we want to be near? How can we be like God to those in the community around us, to our friends, to our family, to strangers? Take a moment to think about that, to reflect on that. Ask God how we can be near like He is near. But for those who need the truth of God's nearness revealed to them, to, today is a chance to ask that of God, to ask God, show us the truth. Show us that you are near, even when we can't feel you. Maybe you'll be wrapped up in His presence this morning. Maybe it'll just be a confidence of truth that you can stand upon. Maybe we won't understand what happens, but this is a chance to feel God's nearness, to know God's nearness. So we're going to sing a song and the band can pick. But if you are just after God's nearness, whatever that looks like, I just encourage you to respond in any way, shape or form. Lift your hands, hold your hands out forward and ask for God, stand up and proclaim Him, whatever it requires. But let's give God the time and attention and opportunity to reveal Himself to us. Let's respond.